So without further ado, um, our next two presenters will introduce someone who not only exemplifies these ideals, but pushes for them in every space she is in. So without further delay, I'd like to call Dan Harris and Rhoda Gibson to the stage to introduce our keynote. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Harris, and I am a relatively new uh, ADAP member. Um, I first met Anita just prior to the fall 2017 action uh, in Washington, D.C. Anita came to our uh, general meeting as sort of preparation for uh, the action, and being a relatively, being a new member, a very new member at that point, I had very limited knowledge of ADAPT and its history and, you know, how the inner workings of ADAPT and how we tried to, you know, we exist to free our people and to fight for disability rights. So Anita was in that meeting and I was super anxious. I was almost to the point where I was gonna back out of the action completely. I, because I had just heard, you know, you get, you know, the police, they rough you up and all this, this just this crazy stuff that I didn't really know if I really wanted to do it. I knew in, in my heart that I needed to be there and I needed to help the cause and to, to free our people. But when Anita came and she dropped some serious knowledge about the history of ADAPT, but also how we take care of our people and no one's gonna leave you alone, and no one's gonna let anything bad happen to you, and we're just a family, but all here for the same reason, and that's to fight for the rights of people with disabilities. So after that meeting, I think I was ready to roll through some walls and, and kick some major butts. So, and I owe a lot of that, actually all of it, to, to Anita, so I'm really honored to be part of this today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rhoda Gibson, one of the co-founders of MassAdapt. Um, by the way, if you're interested in joining MassAdapt, I have sign-up sheets on the tables outside and a couple of flyers about some of the actions that we've done recently. When I first met Anita, it was in April of 2013 as members from Boston Center for Independent Living um, went to our first action in DC. And I found a kindred spirit in Anita. Her intensity on disability and human rights really resonated with me, especially living the struggle of being black and disabled. Our conversations have been intense and really thought provoking regarding racism and intersectionality within the disability community as well as the world. Anita has encouraged MassAdapt members to work together no matter what color, race, or ethnicity one may be, because as we know, disability does not discriminate. A lot of people do. Anita has fought long and hard to open the conversation on racism and how marginalized persons are treated and perceived in ADAPT and in the disability community. Let's work with her to understand and unite the disability community and disability advocacy. Please give a warm welcome to my friend and mentor, Anita Cameron. Good afternoon, everyone. Hold up, hold up. I said good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Anita Cameron, and um, I have been a member of ADAPT for 32 years now. I'm almost going on 33. Um, I have been involved in social justice and social change movements from the age of 16. And every movement that I got involved in 
well, it just seemed like I was an outsider. I was either the only black person or I was the only disabled person or both. Um, I worked, you know, in women's issues. I worked with anti-apartheid um, issues. I worked with um, homeless folks. Um, I worked with uh, the LGBTQ community because I am a proud lesbian. Um, and then I stumbled upon a disability rights group called ADAPT. A-D-A-P-T, all caps. And um, this group, many of the folks looked like me. I found a home, if you will. You see, because I was born in 1965, and I had this guilt feeling that I was born too late to participate in the civil rights movement, too late. And so when I stumbled upon ADAPT, um, it felt to me like another civil rights movement. Uh, one of the founders, Wade Blank, had actually marched with Dr. King on Selma on Bloody Sunday. Um, other folks, you know, had been um, ha either themselves marched with Dr. King or had been actively involved in the civil rights movement. And I thought, okay. As I got along and adapt, um, because disability rights was so important. And in that age, in that time, the word intersectionality, well, let's see, I joined ADAPT in 1986. The word wasn't coined until 89, and I don't think people really discovered the word um, in, in the mainstream until a few years ago it began being used in its some people use it synonymously with diversity, which it is not. Um, intersectionality refers to the intersections of oppression that one may be in, whether uh, one is, um, like myself, a disabled black lesbian or someone who is LGBTQ and disabled, um, someone living at the intersection uh, of being a woman and living in poverty, um, of being a woman of color, or, uh, living in poverty, any, any, um, any of those intersections at where you are, uh, you are likely to be oppressed or marginalized. Diversity refers to different kinds of, of things. So in a depth, that, that never existed. And so what I found myself doing is, I kind of sort of not forgot, but put aside the fact that I was black and dealt with things from a disability perspective that it was all about the disability perspective. Now, just because I looked at things in that manner <laughs> certainly did not mean that I wasn't treated in that manner. As I tell folks, back in the day, the police used to whip our butts and it just seemed like for some reason, man, every time a cop showed up, guess whose black butt was getting beat? Hello. And um, and then I know I began to notice that although there were um, and, and understand when I joined ADAPT, I was 21 years old. I was very shy, mousy, 
and did not speak above a whisper. ADAPT members today would never believe that. <laughs> but that was true. And a specific, specific arrest and an arrest situation and fighting for the rights of one of my ADAPT sisters from my chapter who was stuck in the infirmary she could not get herself her own water or drink, and she's begging and begging, and no one's paying attention. And long short story short, um, Anita rose and became the Anita that ADAPT members know now. And trust me, my sister Gwen Jackson got her water. Um, and so I began to notice that Leadership in ADAPT still tended to be the white guys. And even as the years went by and, and, and people became more aware, it was still the white guys leading things. Eh, every, you know, uh, after a while, you know, the women started leading, but it was still white women leading. Uh, there were a couple of uh, black folks in leadership positions in ADAPT. I happened to be one, but uh, you know, okay, you know, tokenization, yeah, so, you know, back in those days. So, fast forward, things are, are ADAPT is, has gone from a, uh, understand when I joined ADAPT, I think there was like 40 of us on the national action, and we were ragtag militants. They compared us to the Black Panthers and to ACT UP and you know all of those movements. And we weren't given much respect. Um, in fact, um, the FBI followed us around. I remember being in our national office when the FBI came in with the big bomb dogs because they got a report that supposedly ADAPT was building bombs in the basement. Unsubstantiated, obviously not true. ADAPT is an organization that prides itself on its nonviolence because we fashion ourselves after Dr. King and Gandhi. We sat at the feet of those folks and learned, you know, learned from those folks that marched with Dr. King and that were parts of the civil rights movement. So as time goes on, I see that although there are lots of black folks in ADAPT, we aren't in leadership positions. And although we have folks in ADAPT who are clearly immigrants, we're not thinking, I mean, it was like ADAPT, we dealt with our own national issues. Um, back in the day, it was lifts on buses until the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. And then we went back to our roots and we were looking at, okay, redirecting 25% of Medicaid funding to go into a national attendant services program. I was actually involved in writing the first piece of legislation, it turned out to be um, HR 2020. Um, and that piece of legislation evolved over the decades. But once again, I'm saying, hmm, our stories are being whitewashed. Every time you hear stories of disability or stories of what was going on and adapt the face, the picture, everything was white. And I got to the point where I began to question that. And when I began to question that, well, let's just say it was not a pretty scene. Because as we know, racism is something that people don't like to discuss. It's a taboo subject, it's sensitive, um, 
you know, people get defensive, you know, they think that if you um, call them, you know, a, a, a racist or point out racist things that they may do or say that, you know, all of a sudden you're telling them they're a bad person. So it didn't happen. I'm going to tell you what changed me. What changed me? The murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri changed me. And I stopped becoming a disability rights activist and I became a black disability rights activist. And I accepted the fact that I could not separate my race, my color, from my disability any more than I could separate my disability and my race from the fact that I am a proud lesbian. And so we had to begin looking at this. And adapt, try to do a couple of things. Um, to support the people of Ferguson. But unfortunately, it came out centering white disabled people who were victimized and brutalized by police. And while that, was, that is an extremely important thing that has to be talked about, you really don't want to derail a conversation on the shooting of black folks often innocent, unarmed black folks, and then try to center yourself and derail. And so it really led me to really, really push about intersectionality, to push. And as you know, as you're trying new things, okay, you get pushed back. People get angry with you. I figured I was on to something right, because what do they usually say? If you, if people aren't, if you're out there doing activism and all, and people aren't angry with you, you're not doing something right. Okay, so there was lots of pushback. There was lots of anger. There was some ridicule. I got the nickname Angry Black Woman. I was the angry black woman. Ang oh, that's Anita, the angry black woman. That's all right, I took that back and created a blog. <laughs> Some of my articles which have gone viral. So it was like, okay, I'm, I own that, I'm an angry black woman. And finally, uh, in this past year, you know, after I pushed and pushed at leadership and adapt um, and made an impassioned speech at our strategy meeting and said, I am willing to chair this and grab a couple of co-chairs because we really need to work on issues of intersectionality. We are too insular. It said the other, the larger disability community is looking at us. Okay, and I said, frankly, I'm getting real doggone tired of being told that I'm a traitor to black people because I'm a member of ADAPT and ADAPT is a racist organization. Got sick and doggone tired of hearing that. I had trolls on my Facebook page everywhere I went. Tried to defend, you know, uh, adapt in our in our intentions and all, and then I said, "Look, I want these trolls to back off of me, and in order for the trolls to back off of me, I'm gonna pull y'all into the 21st century, and we're gonna work on issues of intersectionality. That's just all there is to it." We're going to work on looking at addressing and dismantling structural racism within ADAPT. 
we're going to look at the biases that goes on you know, within ADAPT, whether it's leadership choosing or whether it's who gets in front of the cameras or whatever. We're going to look at that. We're going to look for leaders who are people of color because those folks are the heir apparents to the leadership of ADAPT. And it is about time to change the face of ADAPT. And so um, we formed our intersectionality uh, work group. Um, I am the chair, Rhoda uh, Gibson and Josue Rodriguez are our co-chairs. And uh, we worked on a few things. We, when the um, situation with the immigrant children being taken away at the border, we actually uh, have a statement on that, on how that is absolutely horrible and this must end. And um, we have ADAPT members now, especially our Texas folks, who are getting involved in those protests and trying to go and visit the detention centers where the children are, where they're being housed. Uh, we have ADAPT members who are very much interested in Black Lives Matter and want to get involved in Black Lives Matter and combat police violence. Because as we do know, a significant portion of those black folks murdered by police have disabilities. That we know. We are, um, we're working on, you know, certainly in light of the Me Too movement and Kavanaugh, um, we are actually at, as we speak, working on a statement about how ADAPT deals with women and the respect of women and how we deal with misogyny in our chapter. Because what we want to do is we want to work on issues internal to adapt and all so that we then become a beacon for the rest of the disability community to, to embrace. Because there are disability organizations that are embracing intersectionality and that are embracing disability justice and all. And adapt, we just have to be pulled, you know, more into the 21st century to do that. Uh, we have on our website, because we learned of a lot of homophobia going on in one of our chapters, that we wrote a statement that we will not tolerate homophobia, transphobia, any of those phobias you know, against the LGBTQ community. We're not going to tolerate that. We have, um, are in the process of writing our statement on, on race and race relations. It's pretty complex, so we really want to do this and really good. But we're actually, um, we are actually working on from the inside addressing this intersectionality, working on that, getting people, getting our DAP folks to know what that means, telling people that, look, this is hard work. And not only is it hard work, it's long-term work. This isn't something you know you take care of in, in a couple of meetings. This is long-term, it's ongoing, because we're looking at changing the face and the leadership of ADAPT. And as we do that, and as other disability organizations look at us, and we can then work out, reach out, and work with other disability organizations to do this. But right now, we wanted to, um, we wanted to clean our own house first. You know, you always clean your own house before you, you look at others. And so that's what we wanted. That's what we wanted to do. And it's, it's a work in progress. We're going to make mistakes. I told people you're going to make mistakes. 
you pick yourself up, you know, you apologize, you don't make excuses, you go for it. That's all that is. And so I must say that um, in the few months that we've had our intersectionality uh, work group, we have done some amazing stuff and we will continue to do amazing stuff. And I think I'm gonna leave it there. And if you all have questions, please feel free. Don't be shy. Ask away. Hello. I'm going to double check this is on. Can you hear me? OK. So I had a really quick question. Um, as an activist, how do you cope with any frustration of feeling that nothing is changing? Um, I currently am active in the organization Cosecha Boston that is dealing with the current crisis um, regarding immigration and ICE. Um, and it's just frustrating, especially in this administration, that nothing seems to be budging. You know, and you've dealt with various different forms of activism over the decades. How did you cope with that and stay committed? By no means am I considering leaving. I'm just trying to understand how can I keep having that fire inside me? Because it's just, with Trump right now, it's just really difficult to see anything changing. For me, for, me, for Anita, Every time I got discouraged, and trust me, it is so easy to get discouraged. I mean, you're just bombarded every day, every hour with all kinds of just horrid stuff. Um, being an adapt for 32 years and working on the Americans with Disabilities Act and then working on the piece of legislation that we have now, the Disability Integration Act, trust me, it can be frustrating when it's like, oh man, nothing's going nowhere. All these politicians are saying no, or they're saying yes, but they're really not being honest, you know, or they're really not being a champion. And the only way for me to deal with that is to know that I can't give up. I don't have, first off, I will say that I uplift every form of activism that people can do. Because I have the privilege to be able to be out in the trenches and put my body on the line. Not all of us can do that. Not all of us don't want to do that. Some people may want to do stuff from behind the scenes. So I totally, you know, uplift, you know, I uplift that and I honor that. But for me, when it gets frustrating, when it seems like that Queen Mary isn't turning, you know, I, I just keep thinking, I can't afford to give up. There are too many people laying in their own muck in nursing homes. There are too many people that FEMA is sending to nursing homes in other states because uh, um, for some reason they won't insist that Red Cross has accessible shelters for people. You know, there are too many, you know, people out here killing their disabled people and then people making excuses for the killing of, dis of a disabled child, yet the parent that murders a non-disabled child is the horrible person that they are. So, you know, all of this stuff, you know, I see, I can't give up, I can't afford to give up at all. And so that's what pushes me, is that I can't afford to give up. This is a huge movement. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than everybody. And if we gave up, guess who wins? You, I mean, you do, uh, things, take, things take decades. You know, look how long it took you know, for the black community to get our civil rights. When I was born, black folks didn't have the right to vote. And when I first started going to school, disabled kids didn't have the right to an education. And it's taken years and years. Look at the ADA. We have it, and we still have issues with it. So as long as we are 
as long as we're out there alive and breathing and can do what we can do, we just have to keep pushing forward. And that may sound easier said than done, but we have to keep pushing forward. Hi, Anita. Um, so one question that I always run into uh, um, as a younger Muslim who doesn't really, I, I have trouble bridging kind of the gap between disability spaces and Muslim spaces. How do you engage with like faith groups and how do we encourage kind of cooperation and co-working towards like rather than pity empowerment and us working together to actually move forward and do things. Because what I tend to run into is a lot of people who are willing to, walk, to kind of talk the talk but not walk the walk when it comes to actually helping us. I think with the faith groups, and I've done some work with faith groups um, as part of my day job, I am uh, director of Minority Outreach for Not Dead Yet. Um, it's a national organization opposed to um, doctor assisted suicide and euthanasia of people with disabilities. And so in that job, I get to talk a lot with faith-based um, folks and organizations. And I try to talk to them about the disability perspective just listen to our perspective about the disability perspective. Look, I respect your faith and all, but can you kind of put that aside a little bit? Because I'm sorry, sometimes faith factors into things. Those of us in the black community know we have issues with mental health issues. We don't want to talk about that. You know why? Because a lot of our community is deep into the church and they say, oh, that's just the devil. Pray that devil away. Say not the day, Satan. And that kind of thinking causes people not to get the help if they want it. Now, I'm not gonna even go into forced psychiatry and all that because I believe that if you don't want it, you shouldn't have to deal with it. But for those of us who feel that that will help us and all, and we need that, being told that it's of the devil is not helping. And so what we have to do is to get the faith-based community to really look at the disability perspective. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of these churches have their, their folks with disabilities, their parishioners, their quote unquote shut-ins or whatever, and sit down and talk to them about their own issues. Like I said, just kind of leave faith out of it, just kind of leave the Lord out of it, and talk practical stuff. And when you talk practical stuff, then, you know, then, then you do. I mean, I think that when you look at, you know, the faith-based community was a huge part of the civil rights movement. And I certainly think, and it's only my personally, I certainly think, and certainly with the history of ADAPT with Dr. King, that he would certainly be for us folks with disabilities looking at the disability perspective. But we just have to get the faith-based community to look at stuff from our view. And once they look at stuff from our view, then it will open their minds. And I've talked to, uh, in New York, a number of uh, state legislators who are very much faith-based and talked to them about the disability perspective. And they said, oh my goodness, you've changed my mind about this. Now I understand. And it may not be easy, but we just got to keep doing it. Anybody else? 
And I think that's it. Let's show some appreciation for Anita Cameron.